So today we've got a couple of presenters here on the next slide. Uh, we have Darren Maggie, CISSP, VCSO, Integris Information Security Operations Manager, Merlita Moore, CISSP, Integris VCSO MBA. And my name is Nick McCourt, CISSP, Integris Lead VCSO. And today we are going to talk about social engineering. And so to start off with, um, Merletta, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what is a social engineering attack and, and how it impacts organizations? You know, social engineering is straightforward directed at people. You know, it's somebody trying to manipulate, somebody trying to influence, somebody trying to capitalize on everybody's desire to be helpful or involved or included. And so, you know, they will... Um, attempt to gather information through a social interaction to exploit later. Awesome. So Darren, when you are working with an organization, do you typically find that social engineering is top of the mind for a leadership team, or is that something that's further down the list of priority? Yeah, it tends to be um, a little bit further down the list of priorities, unless of course they've just suffered a recent, uh, you know, instance. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Merletta, you know, as Darren mentioned, it's usually further down the list. Is that the same thing for you as well? It is. And I'll tell you that one of the things that we see is, in many respects, an over-reliance on technical controls, when actually people is your broadest, they're the broadest, most vulnerable asset and target that any business deals with. And so I think that there has to be a renewed prioritization of training and focus on helping people navigate these types of threats because they are the most vulnerable. Yeah, and I think a lot of times because of the deprioritization, businesses do miss that point and they do miss that component. So I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, just for a moment, penetration testing. Oftentimes organizations will not necessarily get the best out of penetration testing because they do not always add social engineering in as part of that scope. It was considered almost a luxury at the time. I had the opportunity to perform a penetration test where they allowed me to do that social engineering. And the simple truth to it was, it was much quicker for me to attack the organization using social engineering and getting in through either a phone call or an email or even going after, you know, somebody's personal information. If they had a personal email that I found, if it was within the scope, then I actually used that as that attack vector to get in. So social engineering truly is one of the more important concepts of cybersecurity and information security today. So I wanted to move on to the next slide here and kind of talk about four common forms of social engineering attacks. And, you know, I think we all kind of know what phishing is at the end of the day. Everybody's been educated on that. Merletta, could you talk a little bit about phishing and kind of where the focus is with that and how that is just as important as phishing? You know, phishing a lot of times, it's a, it's a phone call. It's somebody getting on the phone and all they have to have is just a little sliver of knowledge about your organization or about your business operations. And through that little sliver of knowledge, they'll try to capitalize and gain additional information that will help them towards whatever goal they're trying to reach. So a lot of times, again, this is a training issue because a lot of times we're so focused on phishing and there's been a lot of training and work done around spotting that email that oftentimes we forget that just old fashioned, straight up human connection and, and who's asking me this and what is their need to know? And why is it coming to me this way? Awesome. Darren, you've been doing this for quite some time. I'm sure you've worked with organizations regarding tailgating or at least consulting and advising them on how to handle tailgating. What types of industries normally deal with or have to work on that physical intrusion and focusing on tailgating? 
Yeah, typically where I've seen tailgating is, uh, you know, or where it's a really big topic would be at uh, data centers, places where, you know, people would be looking to gain physical access, like a data center or uh, some other secure area. It can also be, uh, you know, even password or other credentials that are being used to gain access to otherwise unauthorized areas. So... As far as other industries, such as, let's say, financial or legal or name it, um, they don't always necessarily have a data center. How do you usually handle that discussion around tailgating and, and talking to a leadership uh, for an organization on tailgating? And how do you, how do you spin that or, or talk about that to an organization that doesn't have a data center? Yeah, you know, more often than not, with most things that are social engineering related, a couple of key things come into play almost across the board, maintenance of situational awareness being one. So making sure that people are aware of the situation, they're aware of their surroundings, and also critical thinking. Fair enough. So I think the final uh, of these most common forms, this pretexting, this coordinated attack, impersonating legitimate vendors, Roletta, when you're talking with organizations, what do you usually encounter during those conversations with leadership or management on what they're seeing or what's their current view of how important pretexting would be? Well, I mean, oftentimes they aren't even aware of it. Oftentimes it's an educational process to begin with. And I mean, honestly, um, this kind of enters the field that you don't know what you don't know. And so you have to, when working in these areas and talking to business leaders about them, you know, you have to kind of set the stage to help them expand their knowledge base and expand their thoughts about where threat comes from and how it's executed and different ways their organization needs to be protected because you were right when we started. Pretty much everybody knows what phishing is. I mean, we've spent a lot of time training about phishing, but these other forms of social engineering attacks are not as pervasive, they're not as well known. And so you really have to kind of step back and educate and help business leaders understand what they are, what the risk is, and the things we can do to help mitigate that risk. Love it. So, so kind of envision, if you will, on, on the pretexting, because I want to talk about the vendors a little bit more, but kind of a, a real life scenario where an attacker using a phone call, for example, um, or, and, and again, the phishing, the tailgating, th these can actually both be pulled in the, the phishing as well, obviously, but again, we know about that, but these other items. So, so envision a situation where, um, you know, an organization receives a phone call. Uh, and I think, I think most people have watched How I Met Your Mother or, or have at least heard of it. Um, if you've never heard of the show and, you know, that's okay. You know, I, please tell me or leave a comment. I'd love to know what rock you're living under because I didn't even know about it for a few years and then somebody made fun of me. So How I Met Your Mother, there's a character. His name is Ted. Ted's a pretty heartwarming character and, you know, it's usually his voice in the background on that. So, Imagine somebody getting a phone call from a guy named Ted and, and Ted, Ted, that unassuming character, he's working for your IT provider or he's working for uh, your healthcare provider um, for your employees. And so he calls up and in this case, let's say he's IT. Uh, hey, I've been trying to have uh, trying to access one of the workstations up front. You know, we're having some problems with our system. Can somebody help me get in? And so instead of calling the front desk, maybe he calls the back office. Maybe he gets a hold of somebody that might have some form of authority. And so they go, oh, oh, front office, you need to talk to the front office because they're busy, right? They're busy at the end of the day. Okay, you know what? I'll go ahead and send you to the front desk. And so when that individual, say a managerial type, they send Ted to the front desk, there's an assumed authority there. OK, and th this is where that pretexting really kind of comes in here. That That's where that impersonation really comes in to bear. Not only are you impersonating somebody from the IT provider, but now you're adding on to that authority by getting somebody unknowingly to sign off on you being there. 
And so at that point, Ted gets to talk to somebody from the front who goes, oh, hey, well, somebody, you know, a supervisor or somebody else's supervisor has told me I need to help you. Hey, I'm having a problem. Can you download something for me so I can remote into your computer? And where did that, and where did that just happen that is in our recent memory? Oh, what happens ahead, in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> I mean... Right. That, so that, I knew yeah. say that, right? So I mean, this is a you know, this is a real life situation with this pretexting, and you have a combination. You have a combination of vishing. You have an impersonation going on, and interestingly enough, this person still doesn't have access, but they've gained enough authority to, I don't know, get access. And this can happen not this can happen not only, you know, virtually where you have somebody from anywhere in the world, you know, getting inside help unknowingly from an employee to download something, you know, remote access, whatever. You can also have this in person where it's a phone call from, again, that Ted character, you know, he's pretty friendly on the phone call to a center, for example. Hey, I'm on the way to deliver a computer i'm on the i'm on the way to take a look at your router because there's an issue with your internet there's a sudden sort of okay well we know you're on your way okay yeah i'll be there shortly i'll have a computer that i'm holding there it is so you have that impersonation and that allows you to do a whole bunch of different things on these other three items and of course i didn't even talk about the fishing i really mostly talked about fishing and tailgating Hey, Nick, you have any experience with uh, like the penetration testing story that you were telling earlier? So your experience with social engineering, what did you find were the two primary, say, emotional drivers, right? For a successful social engineering attack. Successful social engineering, uh, number one is transitive authority, which we just talked about. So I will tell you, Merlet is right, what, what's happened in Vegas stays in Vegas, but I will tell you that during a penetration test, in order to get in and effectively steal data, I, I did exactly what I talked about. I ended up getting a call tree through, through a website for an organization. And instead of calling the front desk, I was actually able to bypass the front desk, get to a secondary level. And because of who I talked to, they simply pushed me over to somebody at the front desk who there was plenty of technical controls in place. Keep in mind, right? This is, we're not here to talk about strengthen your technical controls. We're here to talk about what social engineering can do to bypass those controls. And so in this case, there's a 24 seven managed security services provider. You had a very strong managed uh, services provider having very strong IT infrastructure. And at the end of the day, I was still able to get in by having a temporary remote access session from a validated application that wasn't blocked. And it allowed me to steal financial data, steal check numbers, steal, you know, and of course I'm talking about like I stole them. I didn't actually steal them, but I was able to go in and actually take that and even find a way to get it out of that network as part of that exercise. And it's not the only time I've done that. In fact, I've been made fun of before. Well, gee, Nick, whenever you do penetration testing, it's always the social engineering that you go for. Yeah, because it's easier. Okay, I already know you've got a firewall. You might have DNS filtering. You have uh, managed endpoint detection response. You have antivirus. You, you have all of these things in place. But if I can get the right person at the right time. Because as Merletta mentioned earlier, social engineering is essentially hacking the human mind. Right. It is. And we're all so busy sometimes. I'm not here to say that our minds are feeble. It's just we're tired and exhausted. And so if somebody's here to, again, with transitive authority, that would be number one. Number two, and you know, most people would say that number two is fear. Can you strike fear? Or urgency. Um, it depends on the flavor of fear. So in this case, yes, or urgency. So, so, and thank you, Merletta. Thanks. I find Thank urgency to be more of a multiplier of, of the fear and greed. Yeah. So, so right? and you both stole my thunder. I was leading up to the urgency thing. So it's not really the fear. It's the urgency. So having a, so making a phone call saying, Hey, we're experiencing issues with your internet, for example, can I take a look? There's no true fear of, oh my gosh, you're being attacked. It's, oh, we might lose our internet. Well, we don't want to lose our internet. Come in, take a look at this. 
And so those are usually the two big things. There's less from a cultural overview nowadays. There's less of a fear of all of your stuff is going to be lost if none of your stuff is encrypted. Now, if you get in and there's a ransomware attack, then then fear comes into play, and that would be that third element. So let's let's move on to the next slide here. And let's kind of talk about how to spot and stop a phishing attack. And so, Merletta, I want to start off by asking you, oh, did we? Yeah, I think we went down two slides, but that's fine. We, we've got a couple things up here. And Merletta, I wanted to kind of talk to you about through your experiences, both as a, as a VC, so as a VCIO, business administration, all kinds of different things. What are the most prominent experiences uh, that you've had with employees when you're helping them or working with them on, on a potential phishing email? I think first of all, it depends on the company culture and it depends on what preparation the company's put in place. So if you have a company that has a good program of security awareness training and they've invested in helping employees identify these types of risks, then you usually see employees identify and be able to sidestep these things and still report them so that we can manage them. Or you see, in some respects, kind of a culture of fear or dread you know, oh my gosh, I didn't mean to, I didn't. And and so I think one of the things that you really have to recognize is that these things are going to happen. There is no deterrent. There is no control. There is nothing that we can put in place that will absolutely stop or eliminate completely the possibility of these things happening. So the best thing that we can do is have a culture of education and awareness that helps employees identify and be aware of what's going on around them, because it's always easier to deal with something on the front end than it is on the back end. If we can empower people so it doesn't get further down the road, then we're going to be in much better shape. Love it. So, so Darren, did you have anything additional to add to that or some extra areas that you'd like to expound upon? Well, I totally agree with, you know, Merletta. We know that, you know, when it comes to human beings that ultimately, uh, and it doesn't have to be malicious, right? But we know that human error is inevitable. So we actually have to plan for that uh, as if it was part of our architecture. Um, that inevitability of human error means that we have to look for, you know, other compensating controls or other things that we can put into place, uh, you know, things that are going to provide us with more fine-grained visibility into the behaviors, uh, you know, things along those lines, simply because we know that it's going to happen. So it, it would be naive to, you know, pretend otherwise and, you know, just move in a different direction. Let's plan for that, and then let's plan to have those additional controls. Sure. So, so we have up here on this slide, we have a couple of items here and I, you know, we'll start with the first one. Take a breath, right? You've just received an email. Take a breath. I, I don't care if it has the name of somebody that you work with every single day. Take a breath, right? And that first question is, are you expecting this email? And I will tell you in my experience, managing multiple organizations and in multiple industries, when it comes to information security, there's always somebody somewhere that, well, they got it. You're, Ray, if, if I get this email, then it must be important, right? If I get this email, then it must be important. Somebody wants to speak to me. Yes, hopefully they do. But still, if you're not expecting an email from that individual, we, we still want to kind of take a step back and see what it truly is. And and this this ties in, not, not going across, we're going to zigzag here, but down here, you know, this next section, you have beware odd requests. And I, you know, no CEO pays bills and Apple gift cards. This is very common. We see this a lot. I've had experiences with emails. I've had experiences with text messages. I've had experiences with phone calls where somebody's called up. They're trying to impersonate the CEO. 
and they want Google Play Store. They want Apple gift cards. They want an Amazon gift card. What am I missing here? Frozen yogurt, gift card. What else? Well, then there's always Microsoft calling you to tell you of a virus on your machine. Or we've changed no where we're sending our ACH funds to. So, so all these different things is, you know, even if it's within the realm of your responsibility, if it's not something you're expecting, then it most likely is an odd request. And those two are huge. So Merletta, can you talk about the urgency? Cause you, you brought this one up first here in, in the previous one. Let's talk about yeah, that. Urgency. You know, I think you have to think about what the cadence of your business is. And usually when it comes to financial decisions, financial transactions, financial data, you know, there's usually an accepted cadence there and process that those types of decisions go through. And if you're confronted with something that is outside of that cadence, something again, that you're not expecting, something that's out of the ordinary, then by all means, question it. By all means, stop and validate it. You know, we talk a lot about trust, but verify. Boy, I'll tell you what, when a sense of urgency is involved in some type of call to action in an email, trust, but verify, don't just act. Fair enough. Darren, you do know how to spell things from time to time. Can you talk about those grammar errors for, for a minute? Yeah, so the grammar errors <clears throat> are uh, pretty interesting. So it used to be uh, a really solid tell, you know, back before the advent of AI, uh, such as we're seeing it now. So lots of grammatical errors. Historically, there seems to be some, uh, you know, uh, I guess, balancing or gaining of parity right now with the use of AI. So I would probably de-emphasize the grammatical errors as being a primary tell. Definitely something to continue to look for. But again, with the use of AI, large language models, et cetera, that gap is tightening. Oh, Darren, you brought up AI. You brought up AI. So so we, we were, you know, we were hoping to hold this a little bit, but let's kind of talk about this real quick on this. There was an article, actually, I think I got a notification for it late last night, but at this point, AI is being used to write out emails that people cannot decipher between whether or not an actual person wrote it or whether it was AI driven. I know that we as VCSOs taking care of the organizations that we do, we deal with this a lot. We're, we're consistently in the mix here discussing, you know, what to do with AI, how to handle AI, and it is being weaponized because of that weaponization you know, hopefully we can get defenses in place fast enough. Uh, hopefully we can generate things fast enough to do this, but ultimately it's, it's still down to determining how, how to try to catch it on your own, uh, to hopefully stay away from some of this. So I, I play around with it from time to time. I'll get a question, I'll log in and, and try to use a generic question to come up with some sort of coding or, or something like that. And sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm not. Um, so even that can be bypassed. This, of course, this goes into that final section up there, and that's that investigation. And we want to kind of provide everybody with a tone of caution. Investigating is usually best done by, you know, cybersecurity professionals. However, we also acknowledge and realize that people do have to actually get some work done, at, le at least 20% of the time, right? So, you know, there are some notes, check things like the email address. It's mostly a non hands-on type of practice. Go take a look at the email address. Is it actually from somebody that, you know, is that email address from a domain that, you know, or a company that, you know, the next line hover over URLs. If you have a shaky hand or you are tired, do not hover. If you accidentally click on it, you never know what's going to happen, right? I know that we have, I know we have some questions here that, that we'll answer here towards the end as well, but investigation needs to be done with the utmost caution nowadays, because keep in mind AI with generation of better emails and more malicious type emails that really do pass through things, that investigation can lead you down to a place that you really don't want to be. Okay. So thank you. Advice for organizations. 
Darren, t- talk to us about governance. Yeah, so governance um, absolutely required in this instance. If we're going to have expectation of what our employees you know, should be doing or should not be doing, then we have to be very clear in articulating that to them. One of the best ways to do that is to convey those expectations via policy. Once the policy is acknowledged by employees, uh, governance is typically established. So it's a really good place to start, right? Lay out those expectations, let people know exactly how, you know, any, you know, breaches or, you know, running awry of the policy will be handled. And then you go into monitoring and maintenance mode. Merletta, you want to pick the next one you want to talk about? This is kind of a purpose-driven conversation for me because being of a certain age, you know, back when I started in this industry, the IT department kind of sat in the back of the building. You were lucky if you had a closet and, and, you know, the information systems and the technology were interesting, but not pervasive. And now information systems and technology are pervasive in everything we do. They touch everything they do, everything we do. And so this is a very intentional decision. This is a very intentional process. And this is a strategic decision about business operations that businesses have to prioritize and address. And so even though you may not be a technology company, my question to many of my clients is often, if I go in and I shut down your server, how how long can you operate? If I go in and I remove access to your internet, how long can you continue doing business? And for some businesses, it's longer than others, but for all businesses I work with right now, it's not too long. And so we have to reprioritize our information systems, how we manage them, how we protect them, so that they understand that prioritization as well. No argument. Um, so actually, Darren, I know you're kind of talking about the governance, but the adherence starts at the top thing. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences and how you advise leadership teams on this practice? Yeah, <clears throat> the the example always has to be set at the top, always, always. Uh, and it's something that we run into oftentimes, uh, you know, people at a board level would need to be, you know, reminded that they should uh, be redoubling their efforts, uh, no matter what it is, whether it's, uh, you know, BYOD or any of the other areas of security that they would be participating in, security awareness training, what have you. The people at the top are really going to be setting the tone. They need to remember that, you know, the employees are watching. And those folks need to be the primary evangelists of the security program overall. There is a direct relationship between convenience and security. They are absolute counterweights. And so when you move one up, the other moves down. When you move them up, they move in concert. And so oftentimes at the executive level, you see convenience winning out over security. And that's really one area that as a CISO, we need to address because your executive team is by far the most targeted group of employees in the company. And so it's really important for the executive management team to understand their own vulnerability and how that impacts the company and the level of risk. Absolutely. And you know what, Merletta, something else that this reminds me of is the adage that we try to impart with our clients often, which is letting our clients know that security isn't a technical problem, right? And and social engineering is a great example of that. So let me talk a little bit about what regular security awareness training is, because, you know, I I figured I'd I'd let the other two kind of talk about the more fun, exciting things. And, And we have one more fun and exciting thing here, but regular security security awareness training, I always get the same response. Oh, how regular is regular? What do I really have to do? So there are a couple of components to regular security awareness training. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about simply is cyber liability insurance. 
if your organization wants to protect its data and information, because as, as Marletta mentioned, if, if you turn off the server, if you disconnect Office 365, can you do anything, right? So at some point, the, you know, the processes of an organization, no matter what their industry is, if that data is important, then you probably have to have cyber liability insurance. And guess what? Cyber liability insurance, they want you to have regular security awareness training. Not only do they want you to have regular security awareness training, they also have a second line where they ask, do you have regular phishing simulation? And so, um, you know, Darren mentioned always, right? And of course we have a line here underneath regular security awareness training. Repetition leads to retention. It, it's very true, right? So, so what is that repetition? What is What successfully allows you to maintain cyber liability insurance? What successfully allows you to meet regulatory requirements? What successfully allows you to educate your people so that you do not have to deal with a multi-million dollar ransomware attack? And so at the end of the day, security awareness training comes in two specific forms first. One, um, if you want to do it, you want to do it monthly and you want people viewing videos. Yeah, those videos or having meetings. That's fine. Um, but we often like to have it on a monthly basis in small consumable bits, a five minute video where you can sit down, go through that video talking about a specific item, and then you can return to what you're doing. The other part or the other component about this regular security awareness training is phishing simulation itself. Phishing simulation is educational. I was actually in a meeting earlier today where we were having a conversation. And one of the things that I said was, I like to utilize security awareness training platforms for both the video and educational content, but also for the phishing simulation, because the phishing simulation allows me to safely expose employees to potential attacks that they will encounter out in the wild. Out in the wild does not necessarily mean here at work behind my business email. It means my personal email, my Gmail account, my yahoo.com, my, if we still have AOL, right? Whatever your email address is, if you've got a personal one, that is an attack vector on you personally, or it's an attack vector on the organization that you're part of. And so that email does not necessarily have some of the filtering that your organization may already have, or that is provided by your managed IT service provider. You may not have content filtering in place. You may not have those things in place for your Gmail. Now, don't get me wrong, Google's doing their best, right? They've been adding things. They continue to block and help protect. You, you see the same thing with all these other companies out there. We can talk about Apple. We can talk about Google. We can talk about Microsoft. But at the end of the day, that may not necessarily be as strong as what your organization has. It may not be as layered. And so this regular security awareness training once a month or sprinkled across, you may have two phishing simulation campaigns and one security awareness training video every month. That sort of practice does lead to retention. It helps protect the organization. It also helps protect the employees themselves. And so huge component then is to actually build and structure that up. And, you know, something as simple as cyber liability insurance, I know it's not simple anymore, but it used to be, they want you to have it on a monthly basis. They want you to have it consistently. So it becomes very easy to, as an organization, to choose to do that to help protect yourselves. So Marletta, security is an investment. Can you talk a little bit about different components of how security becomes an investment for an well, organization? For any of the business leaders on the webinar, let's just be honest. Let's just call a spade a spade. Security is an expense. Let's just be honest about it. And we can sit back and we could say, well, there's an intrinsic value and in all of this. Oh, okay. But it's an expense. Here's the thing though. In, in the market today, it is a differentiator. And if you don't have it, it's a detractor. And so even though we may not be able to apply a standard ROI equation to your investment in security, there is a reputational benefit to having a strong security program in place. And there is a reputational risk to not having it in place. 
So if you want to have cyber insurance, and let's talk about that, by the way, because how sustainable is cyber insurance? Those questionnaires you're getting, those surveys that you're getting are meant to exclude. The insurance company's actuarial data is telling them this is not a sustainable product. And so, you know, your ability to properly articulate your intentional security platform and how it's executed and how it's implemented is in this market, in this time in business, it is a differentiator, but it is an expense. Let's not joke. Darren, did you want to either add on or dispute that? No, uh, I mean, security is obviously an enabler. I mean, having, you know, having good security in the 21st century is really just viewed as being responsible. You know, as you know, Nick, I do a lot of work with companies bringing them through like 27,001 certifications. That is very much viewed by them as uh, an investment in their security, as well as providing additional opportunities for the organization. So they would use, uh, you know, that certification to be able to carry new business. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, security is an investment. It's something you have to keep your eyes on. I think you had mentioned it earlier, the old adage that, uh, you know, we have to get it right every time. They only have to get it right once. Mm. So, so I, I do want to say, so Merletta, I agree with you. Yes, security is an expense. I will also say that security in my, my experience, security is a moneymaker, right? Yeah, sure. You got to have the expense. I, I agree with that. But, you know, security, and, and this is where security, it, specifically information security, it starts to separate from IT a little bit here. IT is, information technology is what you need to run an organization, Okay. Unless you do basket weaving and you drive the baskets into somebody else and they pay you in cash, right? Then, then maybe you don't need technology from an IT standpoint. But, uh, and, and I love baskets. So this was not against basket weavers. So if anybody here is basket weaver, not, nothing against you. But keep in mind that for many industries, at the end of the day, information security, how you position your information security program, how you position what you're doing for your security awareness training, and how you are dealing with social engineering. As mentioned earlier, it is reputational, but it also allows organizations to go after more business. They can often use the fact that they have an installed security awareness training program. They can use the fact that they have not encountered social engineering attacks that were catastrophic to them to actually build additional business or maintain stability for other governing bodies that are looking to see what they're doing. And so it is an investment. Um, it is an expense. It also can be, interestingly enough, either a money maker or a money saver. And so, uh, and back to that cyber liability insurance, if you're able to actually perform regular things uh, around security awareness training, you may not have an increase to your uh, insurance premium of, 25 percent it might be something as low as six or seven percent which would essentially be a cost of living adjustment and not necessarily a fine because you are showing additional risk and so i did want to kind of jump on that real quick and talk about that did you guys have anything you want to add on I, before we i go do on to the think next the business leaders need to understand that it is in this day and age a cost of doing business it i mean it just is. If you have information systems, it is a cost of doing business. Fair enough. Okay, so the numbers, right? The the, the fun stuff. We're, we're going to zip through this real quick because I, I do want to give us time for questions here. Um, but I did want to highlight all, all of these are from different organizations, okay? Um, so average organization is targeted by 700 plus social engineering attacks annually. This goes back to that conversation on, Hey, we've got all these security layers in place. And I had a question earlier today. Well, well, are we doing anything to block these phishing attempts? We had a director of IT on the call and he goes, you bet. Here's the spam filter. Here's the content filtering. Here are all these other things. 
but keep in mind that even with all that stuff in place, wow, look at how many social engineering attacks might hit you. And it does not matter the size of the organization. You can't expect if, if you're a smaller organization, well, I'm hidden, nobody will find me. They don't care anymore. Nobody cares where you are. Nobody cares your size. If there's a way to get in, they will. You know, if you have a cyber policy that covers you for a million dollars with 15 to 30 minutes of work, you can have a social engineering attack that will target you for $999,000 to keep you right underneath that. And that's what, I think that's part of what we have to stress is this isn't some 30 year old misfit sitting in his mother's basement. These are state sponsored, done in Bradstreet investigating, um, focused on the small and mid-sized business market because it's a target-rich environment. And so for me, and I'm in the Midwest often says, you know, we're just in the Midwest. We're just a small company. Nobody cares about us. Trust me, they care. Because in 15 minutes, they can turn around some pretty significant money. It's a good payday. So, you know, at the same time, Roletta, it's also important to remember that we have very motivated 12-year-olds out there with the internet connections, right? You know, and these people can get online. They can download password crackers. Uh, you know, you could get ransomware as a service. I mean, these things have been packaged up. So we really need to, you know, make sure that our heads and our clients' heads are constantly on a swivel. So, Darren, I know we're close to Halloween. Are you saying Chucky was really actually more likely to be a hacker? Is that where we're I'm going? I'm thinking maybe. I'm thinking maybe. He has a look in his eyes. That's fair. That's fair. I like that. Okay. Okay. So, so um, going over these next items here too, social engineering attacks cost companies $130,000 on average without a data breach. That number is just going to continue to go up, right? It's, yes. It, it continues to go up. Men are 225% more likely to fall for social engineering attacks than women. I know. Typo. Typo. That's total typo. Oh, oh it is? Oh, okay. I mean, I got a link to join this this uh, this call. So, I I mean, I, I would say I'm a victim. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. So, and then 86% of companies, at least one person has clicked a phishing link. That's very true. At least one person. It's usually more in my experience. Darren, your experience uh, working with organizations, is it usually more than one? How, how what, what would you say is an average on through your experience? At least one for sure, but it definitely, uh, you know, depends really depending on the environment, right? So, I mean, I've seen some locations where a single phishing campaign will yield, you know, five, 10 results, you know, in terms of detonations. I've seen other locations that were twice the size of the previous where absolutely no detonations come back. Fair enough. Merletta, how, how about you? What, oh, what have let's you be honest. We've all fallen for it. Let's be honest. Come on now. <laughs> you know, whether it was years ago or not so long ago, I mean, you know, everybody gets distracted. Everybody sees that. Hey, check on your package that's being delivered by UPS when you don't even have a UPS account or you're not even expecting a package. Come on, we've all fallen for it. And many of us are still waiting on a delivery from the Prince of Nigeria who was supposed to I send keep us a yacht, right? you neck, it's I mean, not so coming. We, we know. Just got an email from him this morning. <laughs> Fair enough, you know. Tell him I said hi, by the way. So, so, um, so let's move on to the next slide here real quick. And just simply, you know, it's a question to everybody right before we kind of get into our Q&A section. But who here is interested in learning more about our security awareness training programs? And if so, I think we've got a variety of potential communications for this. But, you know, I, Integris does have a security awareness training program that we deploy. It's phishing simulation, secure, digital security awareness training, uh, phishing reporting buttons, so that if you're not so sure, then you can click and send it away to have it at least go through a system to be checked to see if it's malicious. So, and I think Carl just posted, hey, if you're, interest, if you're interested in this, let us know here in the chat. And for any reason, if the chat's not working, uh, I'm sure Carl will post his social security number and all of his home details here in a minute to for you to communicate with them directly. Thanks, Carl. I appreciate that. Let's move on to the Q&A. 
All right, I'm going to come back for this one. And Nick, I've got that social security number written down here, and I'm going to email it to you over an unencrypted channel as soon as we're done. I'm going to CC everybody that registered. Absolutely. Everybody that's here on the webinar, I'm going to CC them. So the first question we've got here is Trish from Lambertville, New Jersey. We get a lot of spam and junk on our mobile devices through Verizon Wireless. If we have a business account with Verizon, how do we get through or how do these get through just in general? I mean, is, is there anything that they can do to stop that level of spam? Hi, right, Darren, you made noise. Yeah, so, the, you know, this is a big question, right? We had talked about this being a more human hack, right? But there is a larger conversation out there, way too big, you know, for this uh, forum. But um, really, this conversation is security by design, whereas, uh, whereby which we're holding uh, vendors of like scanning, filtering, you know, any of these appliances that are responsible for keeping an eye out and potentially keeping some of these malicious payloads out of your inbox. Basically what the industry is looking at is holding these folks to the flame to have them do a much better job as they're actually designing the appliances so they do a better job of keeping this stuff out. Did you have anything to add on that? Well, and I think as businesses, when you start becoming more conscious about your security practices, there's a lot of questions about where's the boundary, where do we need to stop protecting, but where's the boundary for data security? It's right here. Any place that you have an employee that can touch data, whether it's a mobile device, a remote connection, a PC, a laptop, whatever it is, we have to be conscious about the management of how content is being served up and managed on that device. And so I think as security programs mature, mobile devices, including phones and things like that, will get a little bit more management than we've seen with them in the recent past. And just to kind of bring it back home to the actual question, it's a business account with Verizon. And so Verizon may or may not as a vendor provide you with the ability to turn off different sharing and privacy practices or, or turn them on, turn them off, that sort of thing. I do know that it, it depends on the type of account and I don't want to get too much into the weeds about it, but yeah, Darren was right. You know, ho holding a vendor, holding their feet to the flames on this. Yes. And Truly, it just depends on what they're providing. And uh, Merlot is right. As, as organizations grow larger, they become more aware. So this may just simply have been something that when you were registering, it didn't seem to be a big deal at the time, but that now allows for all of, that, all of those communications to come flowing through. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question. This might be something that I can talk on a little bit. Aaron asks if we had any examples or case studies which illustrate how bad actors are leveraging AI to improve their social engineering campaigns. From an integrous level, that's something that we are working on. One of the projects that we've got in the works is a way to help people develop their own AI acceptable use policies and inform them a little bit about what things are going on there. You know, from a cybersecurity perspective, have you guys seen anyone tackle that? I mean, it's still awfully early in the AI game. Yeah, we're already, you know, I know I've been tackling it with a, a variety of, of organizations already where, you know, oftentimes we, we come in and one of my first questions is, do you have intellectual property? Do you have trade secrets? Do you have PII, PHI? How is that data, you know, how are you leveraging AI within the environment? So, so before we even talk about whether or not a bad actor uh, is, is involved, it's how is your organization using it? And keep in mind that if you're using chat GPT, you enter data in there, it, it now technically becomes public knowledge. And so there is, there's a word of caution on this where if you want to use it, have a policy on how to use it and what to use it for. But keep in mind that, you know, we may have to still block this off, even as this is a new technology that can move multiple industries forward, you have to do it safely. And this next one comes from Tona. 
and it came across when we were talking about investigation. Uh, she commented about the email she got regarding this webinar from our provider, StreamYard, and how that looked potentially suspicious. Um, is there anything else you guys want to talk about in regards to investigating? Or are there any tools that can be used to help people validate if they're scared to investigate themselves? Other than, uh, you know, hovering, doing uh, some of the tests, the examination tests that we've talked about. I've also used Virus Total. I don't know if anybody's had any experience with that, but Virus Total at virustotal.com. You can also use that to potentially detonate payloads and take a deeper look at some of the things that you're receiving. Keep in mind that our security awareness training platform has a phishing button on it that will, you know, that that's a tool to use. For well, and also going back to, were you expecting an email for a webinar? If you filled out the form that you wanted to go to the webinar, then you were expecting an email to sign up for the webinar. So always just go back to, was I expecting this? I'm not expecting this. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to report it. So Kelly asks, is there any way to prevent spoofing? Yes, there are some base controls that I can... You know, some of them are very simple. There are things that you should talk to your IT provider to make sure that they have implemented it uh, uh, for your email, but it's the SPF, DCAM, and DMARC records. Keep in mind, they are simple text records, but they have to be deployed by an IT professional at the end of the day, somebody who actually knows where to go to put these in the right place to make sure that they are set up. And that actually helps keep spoofing down, especially while you're using communications. Okay. So Trish has another question for us here. What happens when you click on a link in a phishing email? And she, she references an iPhone or an Android phone, but I, I think that could probably cover anywhere. You know, what is the process? What happens? It really depends. <clears throat> You know, you could, if you're clicking on a link, you could be delivered to a malicious website, have something served to you there. If it's an attachment, you could click on the attachment. Maybe you don't even see anything taking place, uh, you know, but oftentimes there's lots of things that are going on in the background, but it really depends on the, you know, attack type, what it is that they're looking for overall. I have seen in my base an awful lot of, uh, you know, prompt bombing or notification bombing because people are looking to, you know, bypass multi-factor authentication. Uh, so that's like a, a variation of, you know, the phishing attack. So it, it really does depend on what they're looking for in the end. Okay. Another question from Trish regarding an AOL email that has somehow linked to a company email account. And as a result, they're getting a load of spamming and phishing emails. And is there any way to limit that? I would disconnect the AOL account. Um, for, uh, I would never use a personal email account and, and connect it to a professional email account these days. I know that this used to be more of a standard practice, but nowadays I will tell you AOL filtering is just, it's not that great. Um, they've, they've made adjustments. They have made improvements. Uh, to me though, at the, at the end of the day, it, it's not, uh, as successful at stopping things as, you know, what you would have for a professional email solution. And that's not necessarily to talk about AOL as being bad. It's still a personal email account. So it's not necessarily going to have all of those things. Okay. This question is from Jennifer. It's in regard to the security awareness training. Yeah. Are the training programs scaled to match the industry and size of the business? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, they, they, they definitely are. can um, be. Usually um, when the training is set up, there's a base of uh, cyber principles or elements that we try to get to everyone, but there are also modules that are specific to industries. I have a client that we just added, they're involved in public education. So we added FERPVA modules. And so we can definitely add things that are specific to your vertical. We've got another question from Aaron here. 
Can you explain the impact of breaches to marketing data aggregators like the 2018 Exactus breach and what we can do to keep our information out of these databases? I think I think I understand what, what's being asked. Uh, keep, keep in mind that if your data has been collected by another organization and that organization is impacted or suffers some sort of uh, ransomware or data security incident that becomes a verified breach, uh, if your data is there, it's out. And I, I see there's a follow-up. What happens when job titles and names are exposed? Yeah. I, w- once your data is out there, your data is out there. It, so it's very important. And this is not necessarily social engineering, but this is very much about you know, reviewing different organizations that you may work with, reviewing your vendors, vendor risk management probably could be its own, maybe even a web series at this point. But those impacts... Wherever you have data at this point, if that organization has your data and they suffer something, then your data may be out. You you know, Aaron, this is kind of a cart before the horse question. And this is a place where Europe kind of did a better job than we did in America because we very much rushed to get technology out there, but we didn't really address data privacy very much. We were so excited about the technology being out there that we didn't really, in the beginning, think through the implications of privacy and people's data and how it's managed and things like that. And in Europe, they do a little bit better job of that than we do. So I think in the United States, we have some catching up to do in the area of data privacy. And what we're seeing out in the market right now is we have individual states bringing individual privacy regulation And it's going to be a situation where nobody can fully comply because it's so nuanced. And so I think we're going through that evolution where we often go through in the United States, where we're having kind of a nuanced approach to data privacy, but we're going to at some point have to see some type of overriding regulation to make sure that we can address data privacy correctly. But right now, it's a little difficult in the United States. Okay. Well, I wanted to uh, let everybody know Darren had a hard stop at two. So that probably is a good sign that it's time for us to wrap things up. I want to thank everybody for participating. Nick, Roletta, great job. You know, we're looking to do more of these. So we'll keep everybody in the loop and we'll be back. So the floor is yours to, to say your goodbyes. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming to our webinar. And, um, you know, if there's anything we can do, you can contact your local office or send an email. We'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. See ya. Take care.